Hi, everyone. Thank you for your patience um, and good afternoon. Welcome to the EVPN webinar on the power of inclusive business partnerships to enable sustainable livelihoods. Um, my name is Anita Watson, Senior Knowledge Associate at EVPN, and I'll be moderating the session today. So just before we start, I'll give a brief outline of what it is that EVPN does. Um, EVPN is a unique funders network committed to building a high impact a high impact philanthropy and social investment community across Asia. Currently, we have over 550 members across 33 markets, and we are very pleased to have one member and an inclusive business from our DealShare platform speaking today. Before I hand it over to our speakers, let me provide a brief definition of what inclusive business is and the work that we have been doing in partnership with the Inclusive Business Action Network, or IBEN. Inclusive businesses are activities and models that provide goods, services, and livelihoods on a commercially viable basis, either at scale or scalable, to people living at the base of the pyramid, making them part of the value chain of companies as suppliers, distributors, retailers, or customers. The term base of the pyramid refers to the poor and low-income socioeconomic group of society. In global terms, it currently comprises about 4 billion people living on less than US $6 to $8 per day, depending on the region. So as part of our collaboration with IBAN in 2019, ABPN um, has been working um, and running a series of awareness raising and capacity building events. Capacity building events. Um, just a minute. Um, uh, with a focus on four markets in Indonesia, Thailand, the Philippines, and Vietnam. This began with awareness seminars to introduce the concept to a wide audience in each market, followed by masterclasses for a more targeted group made up of inclusive businesses and impact investors to measure and develop investment readiness um, of inclusive businesses and impact investors to measure and develop investment readiness and culminated in a matchmaking session as part of our DealShare live sessions at the AVPN conference in June 2019. During the session, eight inclusive businesses of different sizes, all involved in agriculture, presented their business models to explore partnerships with potential funders and resource providers. Um, Agronomica Finance Corporation is one of these IVs and is represented by Yona Bickle on our panel today. In the beginning of September, we also conducted two policy-related workshops in Indonesia and the Philippines to explore the role of policy in furthering the goals of inclusive business. Today's webinar is one of the two that we'll be conducting to share our learnings from this multi-stage process. The next one will be held on the 24th of October, and more details will be made available soon on the AVPN website. Just briefly, the four markets Indonesia, Thailand, the Philippines, and Vietnam were chosen because despite sharing similar socioeconomic issues, they are at varying stages of development and reflect varying levels of awareness of inclusive business models. This diversity is important as it presents us with an opportunity to understand the range of challenges faced by inclusive businesses and impact investors in growing the inclusive business space in Asia. Through the activities that AVPN conducted, we found that there's a growing awareness and interest in inclusive business. There are four main trends that we have identified in the course of our work. Inclusive business models and activities are practiced across many sectors, especially agribusiness, but actual numbers continue to be quite small. Um, government support for IB is also gaining momentum. For example, the Philippines was the first to introduce IB accreditation policy in 2017, led by the Board of Investments. But um, there's also been a potential for similar accreditation policy in other markets in the region, like Indonesia and Cambodia. And across the board, IBs have shown innovation in developing technologies and business models that effectively integrate the bottom of the pyramid, um, providing them with sustainable livelihoods. One example is the Vietnam-based Hamona. Through technological innovation, it has managed to ensure that coconuts are preserved in a natural way, retaining their freshness for a longer period of time. And Hamona is this way um, able to ensure that farmers who supply to them receive a stable income throughout the year, whatever the market demand in that particular season. And lastly, um, inclusive business contributes to women's development and empowerment by addressing underlying causes of gender inequality. Great Women, for example, a Filipino company has done exactly this. Uh, it employs women as weavers 
who might otherwise not be able to find work and hires them on a flexible basis to accommodate their social um, and domestic responsibilities, effectively integrating them into the value chain of premium slow fashion for both local and global consumption. So many of the IBs that we interacted with as part of our activities expressed the need for a combination of financial and non-financial resources in building their capacity to scale. In this webinar, we will highlight the partnership between LGTVP and Kenema Food International that encompasses a number of diverse qualities. This partnership began first in 2014 and has contributed to the bolstering of Kenema's inclusive business model and has led to the establishment of Agronomica Finance Corporation, a financing operation established in 2016, born out of the need to meet the felt needs of farming communities that KFI, Kenema, was already working with. These relationships highlight the potential for growth of the ecosystem given strong, long-standing partnerships. On that note, it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers for today. Representing LGTVP, we have Paolo Lim Kao Kao, um, who will be sharing about LGT's presence in Southeast Asia. He will speak about LGT's work in Asia, how it identified Kenema Foods as a partnering company, and the benefits of a long-standing partnership such as the one they've enjoyed with Kenema Foods and now Agronomica Finance Corporation. Following that, Yona Bickle, General Manager at Agronomica Finance, will walk us through how Agronomica was born out of this partnership, provide an overview of the financial and non-financial support provided by LGT, and also share a little about Agronomica's inclusive business model. Um, before we proceed, and I pass the time over to Paolo, a few housekeeping instructions. Uh, we will take your questions after the presentations are done. Please feel free to use the console to type in your questions during the webinar, and I will raise the questions to our speakers after. If you have further questions that are not answered by the end of the webinar, you can email us at inclusivebusiness at avpn.asia. Um, without further ado, I will now hand over the presentation to Paolo. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Sagita. I appreciate uh, the introduction. Uh, so good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the webinar. And along with you and I, we're very honored to, to be hosting today's, uh, today's session. Uh, thank you very much to AVPN for the invitation and we're looking forward to sharing our story uh, with everyone. Uh, before I begin, I uh, also want to quickly uh, mention that uh, and acknowledge the presence of uh, Mr. An Lee, uh, who is on our call right now. So An is our partner and head of Asia and based out of Singapore. Uh, he sits on the board of our Southeast Asia and China portfolio organizations, uh, including KFI. So, so he's, he's on the call and, and can answer potentially some questions later on uh, during the Q&A. Um, so, so yeah, I guess moving on to my presentation, which uh, I'm trying to click forward. Uh, Uh, okay, so again, uh, so my name is Paolo and I work for LGT VP and I'm based out of uh, Manila. Uh, basically, as a quick overview of who we are, we are the venture philanthropy arm of the, the princely family of Liechtenstein and we were established in 2007. To give a little bit more of a context, uh, I want to, uh, on my next slide, I want to show you a little bit about uh, the you know the global finance uh, the money in the global financial world. Uh, next slide. Okay. Uh, so so yeah, as you can see, I mean um, you know I mean uh, if you look at uh, look at the figures on on board, uh, that I mean while you know traditional philanthropy you know I mean has you know I mean does have about 395 billion allocated, it's still a very very small percentage as compared to to the total uh, assets that are invested or in the, or in the global financial markets. Uh, you know, I mean, there's still such a huge gap, you know, even if you include the, you know, the impact investing and the social responsible investing, with regard to the total 85 trillion that, that, that is, uh, you know, globally invested around by various institutions and, and high net worth individuals. Uh, so the idea then was, the idea then was for venture philanthropy to begin sort of crossing that divide, you know, sort of removing that, uh, that line in between the, the investment and the philanthropic, um, the philanthropic side of things, right? So, so sort of bring down that boundary and to try to bring over more capital from the left side to the right side by, by merging, some, uh, by merging the, those types of principles. So, so really that's where, 
venture philanthropy uh, was born. Uh, uh, as the idea was established in 2007, uh, you know, venture philanthropy was meant to serve as the bridge to the, the previously disconnected worlds of, of, of traditional charity and, and investments. Uh, so in the next slide, you can see how, how more or less how this bridge, uh, how more or less this bridge will look. Okay, oops, can I go back? Can go back, awesome. So, uh, so as you can see, so initially, uh, you know, venture philanthropy was, was uh, sort of slated in between the traditional charity and impact investing side of things where, you know, I mean, First, uh, definitely the, the social return, which, which you normally get from investing in NGOs and different programs is there, but also, you know, some form of, of financial return, again, to try to bridge that divide. You know, as, as this idea has grown, uh, you can see that, you know, so also as the, the idea of impact investing has. So impact investing is, I guess, a more, uh, uh, you know, I mean, given the, how venture philanthropy has, you know, how the growth of this market, you know, impact investing has developed into to something that 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 really moves into moves venture philanthropy sort of in the investment side of things, where wherein you both have a high social return and a positive uh, financial return. So basically, impact investments grew as you know as as people in the venture philanthropy space experience uh, experience some success. Uh, so so yes, I mean hopefully this is uh, fairly clear and happy to take some some questions on the context and uh, afterwards. Uh, so going further into LGT uh, VP, um, so uh, as mentioned, we were established in 2007. Uh, so we are more than 12 years old now and have supported over 70 for-profit and non-for-profit organizations globally. Uh, we have investments in most developing regions uh, and also in the in the United Kingdom. Uh, our, we have various we have invested in various industries, including. Uh, healthcare, uh, education, agribusinesses, uh, financial inclusion, uh, uh, organizations that support the government, and also some some interesting uh, organizations uh, in in the United Kingdom that is uh, that furthers uh, technology and the like. So so all of this we've been doing and learning from in the, the past uh, twelve years. Uh, the mission when it was established uh, by by the Prince family uh, has always been to to improve the quality of life of disadvantaged people, uh, contribute to healthy ecosystems, and build resilient and inclusive uh, communities. So we do this both by through our impact investing and venture philanthropy platform. So the the uh, we we do both uh, these days. So both venture philanthropy and impact investing. And as as mentioned, you know we've supported more than seventy organizations in various ways. You know whether it's not for profit, uh, whether it's a school in India called Educate Girls for Not for Profit, or uh, low-cost dental chain called uh, Sabka Dentist in India. So, uh, you know, depending on, on the manner that these organizations need to be supported, uh, we've been able to, we've been able to do both. Uh, LGT uh, does both uh, impact investing in venture philanthropy and in both ways we provide uh, support in various ways, including the, the financial capital, which is necessary, uh, the net uh, network and access to talent uh, and support in various endeavors. In Southeast Asia, which is, I guess, the focus on, of this uh, discussion here, uh, one of the companies support, as mentioned by Sangeeta, is uh, Kenimer Foods International. Um, so I, I definitely don't want to take anything away from Miona, so I'll leave the details about KFI to her uh, and their, financial, their financing subsidiary, Agro Agronomica, but I can share a bit, I guess, on why we, we like their model. So, so we we support K5 because uh, we believe that they contribute significantly uh, to the uh, positive impact to society, both on the social and on the environment side. Uh, their impact to smallholder farmers, the cacao industry in the Philippines, and uh, the, the, peach, uh, the Philippine la land and, and agriculture industry is significant. And, and what we like is that this impact is strongly related to the business itself. They aren't uh, a one-time uh, CS uh, one-time program or a CSR project. Uh, they run themselves as a sustainable en enterprise, and as they grow in scale, so does their positive impact to to society. So basically, to the, to this day, we've provided them uh, with different forms of financing, uh, both uh, actually in, through a number of various instruments, 
Uh, we provided them with strategic support, uh, access to talent through the LGT fellowship program. We provided them with on-the-ground support uh, uh, through regular meetings with, with the CEO. Uh, and as I said, in other initiatives, such as uh, pushing forward their, their ESG, their ESG system and, and their ESG policies. Uh, uh, since our investment in 2014, KFI has, has grown significantly and we are quite proud to be uh, uh, of, quite proud to be one of their key partners as they grow their, uh, their, uh, their operations here in the Philippines and potentially to the rest of Southeast Asia. Uh, and we look, uh, so on the next slide, it just sort of uh, has a little bit more photos and, and increases. In any case, yes, we just wanted to show you some additional photos and how they've scaled to over uh, 19,000 farmers and, and 18 million trees. Uh, so, so yeah, I think with that, you know, we'd be happy to pass it over to, uh, to Yona. Uh, again, we're here for, for some questions afterwards if you have any questions. Uh, but, but yes, happy to pass it over to Yona and I will speak in more detail about uh, KFI and Agronomica. It's all yours. Okay, um, yeah, thank you, um, Paolo. So I'll try to get our presentation started. Ah, okay, yeah. here we go. <laughs> okay, good afternoon, everyone uh, from the Philippines. Um, thanks, Paolo and Sangita, for the introduction and inviting me today um, to share our story on, on how Kenamar and Agronomica work with smallholder farmers here in the Philippines and provide them with opportunities improving their income and livelihood situation. Um, okay, sorry, I'm trying to figure out how the slide works. <laughs> so, um, I mean, as you know, in most of the developing countries, uh, agriculture is really the backbone to inclusive growth. Um, worldwide, we have around 2 billion people living from smallholder farming. Most of them have structural lack in access to technology, markets, financing due to different reasons. They're very remote. Um, there's no strong private sector involved. Um, but given the recent trends in the last year globally in global agriculture and, and food value chains, um, this was on slide too much. Sorry. Um, the, also, global players in, in the agriculture and food industry are more and more under pressure to actually create sustainable and inclusive value chains and um, to draw back on this huge potential in the informal agriculture sector in such countries. Um, in the Philippines, um, besides a lot of nice features and uh, yeah, white sand, we also have uh, 9.7 million hectares of agricultural land cultivated by around 5 million, more than 5 million smallholder farmers. And this means that around 20% of the Filipino population is actually dependent on income from smallholder farming. Um, this is quite substantial, especially com when we compare it with that only agriculture only contributes to 9% to the GDP, the national GDP. So that means a lot of people um, contribute to very little output, <laughs> showing how underutilized the sector is and unproductive um, the current um, sector structures work. Um, against this backdrop, um, Kenema Foods um, was founded on this belief that there is an opportunity to integrate such smallholder farmers into global value chains, let them contribute to economic growth, and at the same time earn a sustainable living income from that. A living income for the farmers and what Paolo said also for Kenamar as a, as a company. So what Kenamar did is um, they created a, what we call the smallholder production platform. So on this platform, we work with the smallholder farmers who we aggregate through a network of consolidators, cooperatives, association, agri-entrepreneurs in the rural areas. And Kenema provides them with all relevant aspects uh, which they need to be able to participate in 
in a complete value chain. So this means planting materials, inputs, it includes training and coaching for the farmers, but it of course also includes a guaranteed market, um, post-harvest and buyback guarantees. Um, so all of that Kenemar provides to the farmers and in return, the farmers sell their produce to Kenemar and which, through which Kenemar uh, makes their profit in the end. Um, one relevant aspect um, in this program, as you can see here, is the financing assistance. So Kenemar started this program in the cacao value chain. Recently, they diversified into different crops, um, but especially in the cacao value chain, cacao is a long gestation crop. So that means in the first few years, there's hardly any income from the crop. Um, but this is the time when the farmer needs money for planting um, and maintenance of the farm. So it's estimate, we estimate that per hectare, you need around $2,000 in the first two years to establish a new cacao farm. Um, but this money um, is not available in cash from the farmer. So access to financing is very crucial. When Kenemar started their program, they started working with government banks, uh, rural banks, private banks here in the Philippines to provide uh, access to financing, access to loans to the farmers. Um, but soon they noticed that, first of all, the appetite for such smallholder farmer financing is very limited. And also, often the farmers are not where the banks are. So locations differ. Uh, farmers are in very remote areas with a lack of infrastructure and banks are feel more comfortable uh, financing around their branches. So this is why in 2016, the idea came up um, with, it, within Kenemar to start their own financing company. Um, so how this works is that, so we have Kenemar, as I just explained, um, which started in 2011, is based on the principle of fair income sharing between all participants in the value chain, reached out to around 19,000 farmers. And then we founded Agronomica in 2016. Um, and the initial task of Agronomica was actually to provide long-term farm establishment loans to Kenemar's cacao farmers. These loans are 100% integrated into the value chain. So that means the origination, so the orientation of farmers, validation of farmers, approval of loans, but also the disbursement um, is integrated. So we don't disperse our loans in cash, uh, but we disperse in form of inputs um, and supplies like the seedlings, the fertilizer, whatever tools are needed on the farm. And also the collection of the loan proceeds later happen through the production. Um, so when the farmers sell their produce to Kenemer, that's when uh, we collect our loan. So it's 100% integrated into the crop cycle. And also Agronomica, like Kenemer, follows uh, inclusive or social business principles. Um, for us, this means especially fair and transparent financing and pricing um, to our farmers. Um, so our farmers are, of course, the most important part <laughs> of this uh, triangle. Um, and uh, what we can see so far is that around 20% of our farmers um, live below the poverty line. Um, this is around the Philippine national um, standard average. Uh, but a lot of farmers live very closely above it, <laughs> to be honest. In average, our farmers have between one and two hectares of land, so they're really small holder. Um, they earn around $1,000, less than $1,000 as average annual income before they uh, participate in our program. But by intercropping in their existing land with the cacao, they actually have the potential to increase their income by 300%. So this is quite a substantial um, impact we can um, generate just by um, integrating cacao to their existing farms. Um, as Agronomica, so who, who are we as Agronomica? Um, so we are a financing company dedicated to agri and rural development. We are registered as a non-bank financing company. We aim at the diversified portfolio. So what I was talking before is our cacao lending program with Kenemar. We have diversified into other crops and other value chains by now also. Um, we see ourselves as a catalyst for rural development, providing fair and transparent financing. So we have a very clear social mission um, as a company. 
Um, and we're aiming to reach out to at least 25,000 farmers across Mindanao in the next years. How we do this? So our agri production um, for smallholder farmers, this is our one product line where we are at the moment still working with Kenema on cacao. We work with Kenema also together on banana and abaca. Um, and we also, as Agronomica, work with different agri, um, agri partners on other value chains like rice and corn, where we're providing financing to their farmers. We also see um, the value chain on a holistic view. And so we also provide value chain um, financing for micro, small and medium enterprises in rural areas. So any kind of um, micro rural enterprises um, needing access to financing for working capital, asset financing, um, they can also avail loans um, under Agronomica. We have a network of partners we work with, though these are our strategic agri partners, as I just said. Um, we work with government entities and nonprofit organizations to provide support to our farmers. And of course, we have a whole range of um, international partners, investors. Uh, we work with LGT uh, being, of course, one of them. And um, maybe to just, uh, as uh, Paolo already mentioned, um, our history working with LGD uh, Venture Philanthropy is um, so they provided debt and equity investment in Kenemar, and with that, that enabled the uh, founding of Agronomica. So there was an, a substantial and very important part. Um, but besides the financing, there's a lot of non financial support which we are receiving from, from LGD. So on the one side, uh, we frequently place fellows, um, which LGT matches for us in our companies. And I'm the best example. <laughs> <laughs> I, I came as an LGT fellow uh, in 2016 to help Kenemar start Agronomica Finance, and I'm still here and running the company. Um, but we also, besides me, also have other, other fellows. Um, we have very good experience. Um, yeah, LGT also worked with us on our impact monitoring and reporting, so introducing poverty indices um, and other social reporting um, uh, indicators. Um, LGT is uh, represented on Kenemar's board, so we are getting ongoing guidance and strategic support from them. And then, of course, linkages and facilitation of networks like collaboration with AVPN and other networks is something where we greatly benefit from LGT and their network. Um, yeah, so this is us um, and these are our farmers. So thanks for listening to me and we are happy to take uh, questions anytime. Thank you so much, Paolo and Yona. Um, like they said, um, we will be happy to take questions now. Um, so for those of you who may not be so familiar with this platform, um, on your little um, portal, you should see a questions tab. Um, you can click on that tab, type in the question, and I will assign it um, accordingly to whomever you want to direct the question at. Um, so we can just kind of start off, um, given that um, it was uh, Yona who just ended the presentation talking a little bit about their model. Um, one of our attendees had a question about um, gaining some clarity about whether or not Kenema is funding Agronomica. And then secondly, if if they are or they are not, what kind of issues have you um, faced in identifying interested investors as well? And where else have you sourced um, your capital and your funding from? Um, to you, Yona. Okay. So, um, yeah, so Kenema was uh, uh, our initial founder um, of Agronomica. Um, they uh, invested equity um, in, in start, into starting Agronomica, but of course, from the beginning, with the vision for Agronomica to become an independent organization. Um, so while we started on the cacao lending program together with Kenemer, um, from the beginning we had planned that within two, three years of operations, we will uh, diversify into other crops, working with other partners. Um, so as I said earlier, we are now also working in other value chains with other partners than Kenemer and also in value chain SME financing, which um, also is not directly linked to the Kenema program. Uh, still the Kenema program, the Kenema lending program is an important project um, for us. Um, <laughs> yeah, so the next question, Sangeeta, is uh, the challenges that we face in accessing finance 
um, to grow the organization, you said. So, yeah, yeah. so currently we are um, in the process of uh, fundraising. So initially when we started, besides the equity of Kenemar and another equity partner from the Netherlands, we, um, we also received a long-term loan from FMO, um, the Dutch Development Bank of $2 million. This capital has been deployed in loans um, as of now. So we are in at the moment in the process of fundraising. Um, so this is where LGT and through ABPN is of course a very interesting and very helpful platform for us to reach out to potential investors. Um, we're looking um, for investors who um, are interested to grow with us. Um, we are still a, a small company, but uh, we have a big potential and, and big plans. Um, so we are raising um, at the moment um, around $2 million in debt this year, but around four to five million in all the consecutive years. Um, so there's a, we have a big appetite for funding. A challenge for us at the moment is that um, we are too small <laughs> for some investors. Uh, and too big for others. Uh, so we are in the well-known missing middle at the moment. Um, so that makes us a little bit, um, yeah, it gives us a challenge at the moment in terms of um, accessing adequate financing, which also matches our business model. Um, because as we said, we, have a, we run a social business model. We make sure that there's enough return, which goes back to the farmers. Um, so we are not, though we are profit oriented, we are not profit maximizing. Um, so we're looking for partners who also are interested in funding such initiatives. Great, thank you, Yona. Actually, on that note, we also got a question. Um, what is the rate of repaying the loan by farmers? Okay, so in the, in the cacao program, uh, our first cacao farmers are starting to harvest now um, because there is a two and a half year, three years gestation period. Um, in which we also apply a grace period um, on the loan repayment. So the first ones um, are, are harvesting now. So the repayment is starting now with the season starting now in October. Um, so by, by then I'll be able to, uh, by the end of the year, I'll be able to give a much better information on this. Mm -hmm. But currently our NPL also from other loans is at around 2%. Mm, thank you. And then now for Paolo, um, for LGT, so what motivated your decision to invest in inclusive business as opposed to other types of social um, enterprises? Uh, uh, thanks, for, thanks for the question. Uh, I think for us, uh, again, the motivation was, uh, again, first and foremost, uh, as I mentioned earlier, was to find businesses that, you know, I mean, that, have, that are sustainable and that have, have that, uh, I guess, that impact inherently uh, uh, in their in their business model, right? So so for us, we didn't really. I mean, obviously, uh, you know, I mean, for us, there are those labels such as uh, inclusive businesses or social enterprises. But for us, you know, we're we're really more about you know the company itself. So regardless of of what they call themselves, uh, or if they 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 have some form of uh, you know, I mean, that type of label. But for us, it's really about uh, you know finding the right businesses that that you know that are again uh, you know that are sustainable that can that can grow that can scale you know scale is very important because we want to impact as many people as we can and we want to help as many companies grow as as we can right so so for us it's 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 really more about what the company is doing uh, you know how you know what their what their business model looks like how they're affecting the base of the pyramid as i think as you mentioned earlier you know, I mean, how they're how they're including the base of the pyramid, whether it's as their customers, suppliers, uh, and uh, you know, and, and logistics providers, etc. So as long as there's some involvement by the base of the pyramid, then then we're happy. Then of course, uh, you know, I mean, it can't be, uh, it has to be an inherent part of their business model, right? So so the impact can't be on the side. We're in it's just the Caesar project. We want it to be, uh, you know, core part of the business, so that you know, as we grow uh, the company, uh, the impact. Uh, grows as well. So, so for us, uh, you know, it's less about uh, the labels, although of course that, that helps us. Uh, that helps us uh, understand uh, who. I mean, and and you know, really look into who who put that together. But for us, it's really also about evaluating the right types of, right types of businesses. 
So one of the questions from our uh, audience was also that the IB model often includes farmers. Are there any other people that you also include from the communities that you work with that you're impacting? I think this question goes to Yona. Um, so in agronomic, we, we have these two, two tracks, um, basically. One is uh, farmer financing, agriculture production financing. And they are, of course, our main target group are smallholder farmers um, with the three hectare and below. Um, and then we have our other track, which is more focusing on small business loans. So this is micro, small, medium enterprises um, in the rural area. So these are small businessmen. They could be in trading and processing and logistics. Um, so these are people you find everywhere. And we, we think that as we are already in the areas with our operations, it makes sense to cater to them as, as well. And also for our farmers, in order to improve the agriculture and contribute to the agriculture sector, it's important to look at the complete value chain. Um, so this is why we see this as our second track. Um, in general, of course, uh, women are as much involved as men um, in our model. In the Philippines, we don't really have such a structural problem um, with gender inequality. Um, so a lot of our farmers are actually women, um, often the land title, yeah, it's sometimes even if it's in the name of the man, husband, the wife is still the one cultivating the land or the other way around. Mm -hmm. So there's a very equal contribution um, here. Uh, yeah. Great, thank you. Yeah, so definitely in terms of um, the social impact, there's a wide range of impact and many, many different communities of people are, um, are impacted by the work that you are doing. Um, so maybe back to um, Paolo, what were your main uh, impact objectives when you made your initial investment in KFI and how did you track your progress? Uh, yeah, uh, so that's a great question. So I think I, I'll start by first on, on the broader side, right? So when we evaluate companies, we obviously try to understand yeah, their target beneficiaries or, or who they're helping out, right? I mean, on their business model, whether it be their customers or suppliers or some part of their value chain. Uh, so, so yeah. Once we once we try to, once we understand, uh, we develop uh, for ourselves an uh, initial theory of change, and you know, so that goes on uh, for discussion throughout the investment process. You know, both with management and internally, we we discuss and how on the, the company's theory of change, and you know what how we believe in it, and and you know how we see it growing. Uh, so with that, uh, so we develop uh, different KPIs for different organizations, right? Uh, so depending on on what the companies can track, depending on on what the companies are af affect, right? We we try to figure out what what's best for us. I guess very similar to when you're tracking uh, on the financial on the financial side, right? You track revenues, you track uh, if it uh, you track gross profit, right? So you have these metrics that you track when understanding the financial the the financial aspect of the business. So in the very same way, we approach impact the same way. Mm. We develop uh, social KPIs uh, uh, that we measure uh, on, a, on a quarterly basis. So we, 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 we speak to company, we speak to the company to develop these KPIs, make sure they're not uh, too burdensome to collect. We make sure that you know, it's, it's pragmatic, but at the same time, it's very useful information. Mm -hmm. uh, so as much yeah, we collect it, I guess similar with the financials, uh, you know, along with the, the company's revenues, they, they submit for us, for example, the number of smallholder farmers. Uh, so with regards to KFI, uh, the, the, we, we track a number of KPIs here, including the number of smallholder farmers in their network. Uh, we, we track the number of uh, cacao doctors that they've trained, which are basically uh, agripreneurs uh, that, that KFI, uh, that KFI uh, makes possible. We track the number of hectares that they've planted and the number of trees that they've planted. So, mm -hmm. so these were our initial KPIs that we, we track with, with, uh, with, with the team. And of course, as, as Kenema grows and as Agronomica grows, we continue to develop, update, you know, maybe add, uh, add a little bit more. You know, especially as as as, as KFI, you know, increases in in terms of the database, you know, to continue to develop the impact KPIs uh, moving forward. Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, we tra we actually I guess we track progress through, you know, we we come up with budgets similar to I guess you know financing budgets. We come up with budgets each year, targets that KFI would like to hit. So so mm -hmm. we we measure up across that and also see what type of trend it does historically. Mm -hmm. uh, so so yeah. Uh, that's, um, Great. Um, thank you. I mean, in a similar vein in terms of tracking impact, um, a question to Yona. 
how is the system you set up to mobilize and organize uh, working with 19,000 farmers? How do you create the sharing and learning mechanisms um, with these farmers? <laughs> yeah, it's not easy uh, to work with 19,000 farmers, I agree. Um, so basically, um, we, we, in Kenema, we, we have uh, different areas in which we work. So um, the main look, uh, region we work in is Mindanao, which is a, a big island in the most southern part of the Philippines. Uh, but we also have some operations in Palawan in uh, the west, uh, big island in the west, and also a little bit on some other islands in the Visayas. Mm -hmm. So we are pretty spread out. So we have regional teams um, catering in these areas. Um, they're in all areas, we are trying to establish their own nurseries. Um, so cacao seedlings are grown in the areas. Um, the farmers, they can see um, actually cacao farms and plantations in these areas. We work um, on uh, demo farms, demonstration farms, which also can be used for training of farmers. And of course, in the end, we aim at buy, uh, establishing um, buying stations in, in all of the areas. So um, to provide a complete value chain and a complete infrastructure um, to these farmers. Mm -hmm. We are currently working, um, besides that physical infrastructure, we are also um, having, of course, some digitization and technology involved. Um, so we already use uh, some software also to exchange among internally among the team on challenges, on um, progress, on orientation, origination, training of farmers, mm -hmm. um, regular farm monitoring, which a little bit like Facebook. It's a software developed by Facebook, so it's very easy for our field staff who love Facebook um, and who are familiar with Facebook. They can easily use it. They can share their daily updates. Um, then our training team, also our research team, they can comment directly um, and give directly advice to our technicians in the field on what to do on specific farms. Mm. Um, but one thing we are in the process of, to, of uh, integrating at the moment in Kenemar is a more comprehensive traceability software mm. um, because now most of our farmers are becoming slowly productive. So out of the 19,000 farmers, currently five to 6,000 farmers are, are harvesting already from their farms. The others are still in the gestation period. Um, so we need to be able to trace um, the production um, in order to um, follow international certification standards to get premium prices for our beans. That's an integral part of our business model. Um, so that's what we are in the process of setting up. Thank you, Yona. Um, and somewhat in connection to that, so um, no, in your presentation, you talked about um, the, the impact of your work on women. Um, so one of the questions that came in was, how do you distinguish between men and women in your value chain? So, um, interesting question. I need to think about that. <laughs> um, so, I mean, in the first place for us, um, it, it doesn't matter if our farmer or our client is uh, the male or the female partner of the uh, um, family. Interestingly, what we see in reality is that, um, I mean, most of these farmers, as I said, they're smallholder farmers. They have 60, 70% of the income comes from the farm. Um, so this is really like, a, we actually see them more as small enterprises, farming enterprises, each individual family. And what we can see is that often in the initial phase where we are planting new trees, where the land needs to be cleared, uh, holes need to be digged, the trees need to be planted, that's often a very physical um, work, which is often done by men. Um, and then later, especially when the production starts and the harvest starts, it's actually the women taking over. Um, so there we see suddenly much, much more women involved because women are doing much more of the accounting and household financing and household work in the Philippines. Um, so they are more in the house, in the farm anyway, so they can easily combine their regular schedule with the harvesting schedule, uh, which is weekly. 
and can be scheduled quite flexible, um, while the men will go out and do other physical labor work again. So overall, all genders are involved, but we can see a little bit from experience over time that the roles are a little bit different. Ah, great. Um, thank you very much. Um, and again to Yona, um, so you have been doing very good work, um, but moving forward, you said that you were looking for new rounds of funding to scale. How do you see your future goals for the farmers in the next five years? Do you see them, um, do you see these goals uh, changing in any way or growing? Um, and this question says, for instance, in improving yield and their income. Yeah, so I think uh, there's a, a lot we're doing on this um, area. So one um, aspect, for example, that when we started, we focused actually on cacao. So we thought there's a lot of, as you saw also in one of my pictures, there's a lot of coconut um, areas in the Philippines and uh, cacao is actually a good intercrop into an existing coconut farm because coconut provides some um, shade for the cacao. Um, what we noticed over time is that these cocoa areas are often they have not really been taken care of. Uh, these coconut trees are decades old. Um, there's hardly any fertilizer applied. So actually the soil of uh, the, the farm is not really good. So we noticed that um, we need to change our approach. We need to focus much more on an integrated uh, model, uh, which is a more farm centric model instead of a crop centric model. Um, so what we are looking at the moment is um, to provide like a multi-crop approach um, with different type of trees and, um, and crops, uh, which uh, in each other help each other to grow and incre increase the productivity. For example, some of the crops might be nitrogen fixing, others are really good for the organic matter in the soil. So they enhance each other in um, increasing the yield. But what's especially important for us is also that it smooths a little bit the cash flow for the farmers. Because what I said earlier in cacao, you have a three year gestation period. So by being able to intercrop with other crops which have a shorter gestation period, of more of a cash crop in the early years, um, we'll be able to, so, to provide our farmers with the more smoother cash flow projections. Um, so, so that's on the one side what we're doing, but on the other side, also from an agriculture perspective, there's a lot of research we are doing on different clone material, different farming protocols, um, and all of that, as I said, different intercrops, everything which helps to increase yields. We are looking at zero budget farming um, on, on the farm, composting generation. So there's a lot of research in, in this area going on. So we hope that uh, we'll be able to, yeah, increase more and, and improve the opportunities for the farmers more through that. Oh, wow, Yona, that sounds really um, exciting. There seems to be a lot of things in the pipeline. Um, and oh, I mean, we've heard quite a bit about how you know your partnership model has enabled this um, out these outputs as well um, but there's a question from uh, another one of our audience members how have you has there been any challenges in managing this long-term partnership um, especially um, on uh, in terms of assessing different like performance indicators and time frames mm -hmm. and organizational structures have you faced any challenges are there any risks associated with this how do you ascertain who a good partner is uh, this is for both of you. Uh, yeah, so I think, uh, you know, I mean, uh, uh, definitely, definitely there's been challenges, right? I mean, obviously in, in, in any, in most partnerships there are. So, so I think for, so for us, I think the way we try to effectively manage it, at least on our part is, you know, I mean, we try to be, uh, you know, I mean, as, uh, as I guess as available as, as possible to, to to Kenimer and Agronomica, right? So I mean, we 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 try to be, uh, you know, I mean, as as close a partner as we can be to them. Uh, so so as as mentioned, you know, I mean, uh, we aside from the quarterly reports that we that we request for, and aside from our presence on the board, we also have regular catch-ups with with the Simon and the team, right? So I mean, Simon, the CEO of Kenimer, uh, is we we regularly have catch-up meetings on operations, on financial results, on on impact. On, on strategy uh, and then also of course Yona uh, we have frequent catch-ups with Yona whether on the phone or in person when she's here in Manila so for us I think it's uh, uh, it's all about alignment right uh, so as long as obviously you know I mean we have 
again, we, we, when we discuss KPIs, whether financial or in, in, uh, 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 whether financial or on the impact side, uh, and you know, uh, objectives, uh, timeframes, and, and the structures, we, we always have our thoughts, and obviously the organization will always have their thoughts, right? So it's all about discussing, finding, uh, uh, I guess, a middle ground, finding a place where we agree on. And fortunately, you know, it's, uh, you know, we have had our fair of challenges, but it's been very good to work with, with KFI. So I guess we're, we're open to both sides and, and, you know, there's, <clears throat> there's really this, uh, you know, this, um, I guess, uh, this, this good relationship between, between the two parties, right? You know, if there are any issues and, you know, normally there are, you know, I mean, uh, KFI is very upfront. Uh, they make sure to inform us ahead of time, right? So uh, even if it's not easy uh, to tell, uh, an investor uh, about issues. We, we we try to make it as as comfortable as possible, but at the same time we 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 try to we try to help out as 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 much as possible. So I think it's it's all about alignment. I mean I think even before we invest in any company, uh, you know, especially K5, we try to see if there's alignment and uh, you know uh, with with the with the with the company's management, with the company's founders, to see if there's somebody we can work with, right? To see if that. We can tackle challenges uh, together, as they say. You know, when we invest in a company, it's like a marriage. Uh, so, so you know, during our dating period, we really try to get to know, uh, we get to know the team, and before we we jump into our and do our proposal, right? So, <laughs> so I guess you know, we just try to 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 figure things out. And I think, um, yeah, from our perspective, I think uh, for us, I mean, working with with LGT has definitely been very very positive. Um, they are very flexible and open. Um, we have uh, other investors also. Um, so LGT is always open to align with the requirements of other investors also. So for example, we came up with a joint impact and results chain um, where we agree on certain indicators uh, which we will report to all of the investors. Um, so all the investors uh, sat together and, and, and worked this out. So I think um, these kind of things we are, we are doing jointly um, and we are always doing together. So that's been um, very important and for that LGT was very supportive also in the struggles Canemar Agronomica have. I mean, we are growing, we are having different challenges every day, um, but we feel also it's important to be honest. Um, and to be direct to our investors um, and, and yeah, tell them what, what are we facing today, which we maybe did not foresee yesterday, um, and to share and have an open dialogue about it at all times. Great. Thank you both so much. I think that's all the time that we have today. Thank you, everyone, for your participation in this very interesting session. Um, if you have any further questions that uh, were not answered in this webinar, again, you can email us at inclusivebusiness at abpn.asia, and we will do our best to get back to you. Thank you so much, Paolo and Yona, for sharing your inclusive business partnership and journey with us. Uh, we will be posting this webinar recording on our website um, soon, so please look out for it. And before we end, uh, please be informed of the following avenues to continue engaging, you know, with inclusive business. Um, there's the DealShare platform. It's ABPN's DealShare platform available at abpn.asia slash DealShare platform. Uh, you can find a collection of inclusive businesses there and other types of businesses as well, um, just so that you can understand different business models and um, identify um, different potential for investments. And also we will be having another um, inclusive business webinar um, next month on the 24th of October, where we will be profiling two IBs of varying sizes to highlight the range of opportunities and challenges faced in enabling social impact and financial viability, especially in light of growing policy engagement in this space. Um, and then, some of you might also be interested in the upcoming Inclusive Business Summit, uh, the second in ASEAN's efforts to grow the ecosystem. And this will be held on the 1st of November um, the, at the end of this year in Bangkok, Thailand, um, as part of the 35th ASEAN Summit. So on that note, uh, thank you, everyone. And we look forward to seeing you around at our next webinar or event. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Hope it was helpful. Bye. Bye. Those are questions.